Good evening, good people. We are here for our January 25th general session of the City of Muskegon City Commission, and we are going to begin with prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. If you care to join us, we have Reverend Eileen Stofan from St. Paul's Episcopal Church, downtown Muskegon, to lead us in prayer today. Please. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be present with those who take counsel in this meeting for the renewal and mission of preserving the well-being of this community. Help us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. May all our works begun, continued, and ended. Glorify your holy name. And as you brought us safely here, guide us safely home when our work is done. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you again, Reverend Stelton. Take care and be well. All right, matter of fact, may we have roll call, please? Vice Mayor German? Present. Commissioner Gorman? Here. Commissioner Emery? Here. Commissioner St. Clair? Here. Mayor Johnson? Here. Commissioner Hood? Here. Commissioner Ramsey? Absent. All right, we have the consent agenda on the screen. Commissioners, you've had an opportunity to review the agenda since you received your packets. Oh, yes. We have public comment on any of our consent agenda items. So before we uh, all proceed. All agenda items. Oh, yeah, actually, all agenda all items. Agenda. Move to a public on all of our agenda items. So if anyone would like to speak on an agenda item, note that we do have a separate public hearing with regard to the Parks and Recreation five-year plan. So if you have comments with regard to that, I would ask you to reserve your comments until the public hearing. But if you have um, comments on any other agenda items, you're welcome to speak now. You have three minutes as an individual. And if you are representative of a or registered organization or group, you can have up to 10 minutes to speak. Anyone want to speak on agenda items right now? All right, I do have two requests to speak on, during the public hearing, so um, they have been received. All right, then we shall proceed with the consent agenda. Commissioners, we have an opportunity to review. Are there any items that you wish to have removed for further discussion and a separate vote? Yes, oh, Vice yes. Mayor um, Item uh, K. Any others, commissioners? All right, and welcome a motion to adopt the consent agenda as presented, minus item K. I move to adopt the consent agenda as presented, minus item K. Support. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Gorman and a support by Commissioner Emery. Roll call, please. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? Yes. Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor German? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Vice Mayor German, item K, deficit elimination plan for the convention center. Oh, yes. Thank you, uh, Mayor Johnson. Um, I move to approve the deficit elimination resolution for the convention center fund. Support. All right, we have a motion by Vice Mayor German, supported by Commissioner St. Clair, for approval of the de deficit elimination resolution for the Convention Center Fund. Ah, oh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, if I could, oh, Mr. Grant's up there. I guess he can um, just kind of guide us through this process. Um, just a couple of questions, and I've been getting questions from the public. Um, could you kind of explain what's going on with this item here? Okay. Um, and how we got here. Okay. 
Um, we got a bond for the convention center to, um, to do the construction, and um, we had some delays and we had some other things going on with the convention center that, and the cost of um, building supplies went up during the COVID and things like that. So um, with that and just the cost of building supplies and other things, we have went over over budget. So that put it, put them in a deficit. Yeah, put it in a deficit. So, and this is just the deficit. This the one that I'm presenting right now is only for the fiscal year that ended um, July. I mean, I mean January. No, okay, no, the one that ended June 30, 2021. Oh, okay. So, uh, and I talked to Frank, and we're we're still going to have some things that came in in this fiscal year that I think Frank is eventually going to come to and ask you for to get additional funds. Of those costs. I'll go ahead. Yeah, sure. I, I think the commissioners should have received an email from me with a breakdown of all the costs. Mm -hmm. I went over them with, with the mayor um, last week just to make sure everybody understood. That um, spreadsheet you have is all inclusive. So as you go through that spreadsheet, there's a lot of information there, but it essentially accounts for every expense and every revenue related to that convention center back to the original conception of doing, I think, in like 2017 or 2018. And then the number, the total, the total number I think on there was that it was about $2.67 million was the amount of money that we think um, should be appropriated um, to cover the overages at the convention center. Now, Ken didn't go into a lot of details, but, and some of you are, are newer, so I'll explain some of the big ones. But if you remember, there were, there were two, well, there were really three big issues that happened there. One, we discovered PFAS in the groundwater, and um, it made dewatering for the um for the foundation is very very expensive essentially and the water table was uh, was unusually high at the same time so pretty much millions of gallons of water had to be pumped from that site treated and then and then trucked away um and so we were playing we were paying to treat it on site and then we were paying to treat it again at the at a water at the wastewater treatment plant and um that was hundreds of thousands of dollars, and and luckily, um, Senator Bumstead came through and helped us get some funding towards that. But there were additional delays and things like that that were related to it that couldn't be grant funded, and those are included in here. The other thing we did is we struck oil on the site, and we un uncovered. Good way. <laughs> yeah, it was not valuable oil. Uh, <laughs> it was mostly salt. It sounds like. Um, and but anyway, that that expense um, right along the edge of the um, of the delta, we. We uncovered a, like a 2,000 foot deep uh, abandoned oil well that was improperly abandoned that the state um, had a program set up to deal with. Now, again, they covered a lot of the expenses, but they, there was a lot of it that they couldn't. And a lot of the stuff they couldn't was like the redeployment of the site. So, for example, we pretty much had to put that piece of the convention center on hold and continue to build around it. Well, there was a significant additional cost in coming back and, and almost rebuilding that side of the convention center, but the goal was to keep it on track. Um, and then the third thing, obviously, was COVID-19. And so we were shut down for a short period of time. Um, but <clears throat> as part of COVID-19, we, we had a number of carrying costs. We had a, a number of things that we had only soft bid, so to speak, leading up to the construction. And then by the time um, supply chain issues started becoming apparent and, and the ability to source uh, materials uh, became a bigger issue, all of a sudden things that we thought would cost us um, one amount cost us significantly more. Um, and then the fourth thing, which was which was driven more by us, but it was a de decision we made before we knew all these things. We decided to finish that room in the lower level. If you remember, the lower level room is it's uh, the transnation room right now. Um, it was all it was meant to be unfinished to be finished at a later date. Um, and and um, originally we added that as a change order. It was a few hundred thousand dollars to uh, to get that finished, and it just made a lot of sense to do it. And in hindsight, we still think it was a good decision. Um, but had we known that we were going to have a million or two million dollars of additional expenses that were that that were unrecuperable, um, we might not have made that decision. But it was the decision had already been made, and the the, the lower floor had already been finished. Um, good news is, if you remember, we were we were originally thinking we'd be about two million over. So we are. So two point six um, sounds like a lot, but I mean it was closer. 
it was a little bit more than what we thought. And we originally sold the Van Dyke mortgage naming rights specifically to pay for this. We sold the Transnation ballroom in the basement specifically to pay for this. And we'll be um, selling naming rights in the main ballroom to help pay for this as well. So also in that in the um, spreadsheet that you have is the amortization schedule that shows you how the city gets paid back this 2.6 million dollars and some change over the, you know, over the year, the course of a number of years, um, um, to be made whole plus interest essentially. And, um, I'll answer any questions if you want, but I think that pretty, that pretty much sums it up. Um, I do want to make, um, in our deficit elimination, it says 2.5, but I would like to change that to reflect, um, it's two point two million six hundred sixty eight dollars nine thirty three oh seven. <laughs> Have that reflected on record so we'll transfer the right amount can you repeat that again two million six hundred sixty eight thousand nine three three oh seven thank you thank you for the update mr grant okay any other questions one other thing i'll point out is that doesn't mean that the fund today right now is that far under so we're going to put in all the money that we think we need, and we, th we think this will cover everything. There's a couple expenses that are still kind of sitting out there that will be paid. But at some point, the fund will be exhausted, and these monies will, if there are, if there are dollars left, they'll come back into the, to the general fund. So it might, it might be that we don't need, which, why, which was originally why Ken had $2.5 million on there. He thought that's the number that we needed. I think we should represent the full number on here, make the transfer, and then what we don't end up using, send back. Um, and it might just be because we've already funded some of this in a, in a different way, just because it's, it went back through two different funds in four different fiscal years. So I want to make sure, which is why you have that, that spreadsheet in front of you, you have every expense. So Ken was saying it was about two and a half, but when we added up every expense, I think it's really 2.67 million. And so we might as well account for all of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Um, in terms of outlook for this, when you said when we close it out and return any remaining funds, what is the outlook for uh, our timeline-wise when we'll have this fund um, resolved and closed out? Hopefully it's pretty soon. I, we should be at the end of this. Um, I would say by the end of this fiscal year, we should know uh, for sure. Um, and, and like I said, if we don't transfer all the ARPA funds over there, we, we'll use them for something else. Okay. So, Go ahead. We have some concrete work to do in the spring. Um, that that's the big thing that that we're waiting for, and then there's some there's some some tallying we need to do and some reimbursements we need to give to Parkland for some things that we owe them, and those are really the two only outstanding things. Unless bills have come in since the first of the year that I don't know of. No, I think we had one small bill for six hundred dollars the other day, but that's October or something. But that's about it. Okay, so we're looking at a transfer of rounding up $2.7 million that will uh, get paid back over time using the uh, sponsorships and naming rights for that, in which case, if according to the amortiz amortization schedule provided, which is relatively conservative um, and is not inflating, although we could expect some inflation in terms of the sponsorship revenues over time, uh, that sh is showing about $2 million in interest that would be accruing to us. Uh, so we'd be returning essentially $4.7 million that we anticipate putting into our parks yeah. system. Um, and we're going to be setting up a dedicated parks fund to receive these. I know this hasn't been finalized yet, but we've talked about this, but that's what our intent is, at that's, least. That's I, don't, I don't know if we need a dedicated fund. I, I mean, if I could track it another way, um, because the more funds you have, it's, it's just more work for us and our auditors. I mean, I could track it other ways. Um, we could definitely dedicate that. The, the interest goes to parks. We could transfer that to parks easily, okay. no matter what fund is in there. We're, we're going to kind of look at what our options are, and Ken and I talked, whether it's a park fund or something similar to the way that we just segment off a piece for the um, the rainy day fund or the budget stabilization fund, st 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 stabilization fund. <laughs> Well, or, or whatever it is, we we can we can account for the money very specifically for parks. Okay. So whether we do create a dedicated parks fund or we keep it within um, our general fund or public improvement fund, we will earmark these payments to go towards our parks and recreational programming in the city of Muskegon. Yes. Okay. And questions or input, commissioners? No. All right. And we'll go on with roll call, please. Commissioner Emery. Yes. Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. 
Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor German? Yes. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, we will proceed with public hearings, Parks and Recreation, five-year plan. And we have our DBW Director, Leo Evans, here to lead us out on this. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I will be very brief today. I have uh, Tiffany Smith from MC Smith Associates here to cover all the legalese things that the DNR wants to make sure we say in this public hearing. Uh, but we are here today to host a public hearing on the draft five-year parks and recreation plan that was created for the city. There's been a draft of the plan out available for public review for I think approximately six weeks now. And as we discussed earlier this month, this plan is due to the state on February 1st. So this is our meeting to adopt the resolution and support and finalize that plan. And by submitting this plan to the state on February 1st, it will make us eligible for all DNR grant funds, things like that, which open up on April 1st. Um, so that's kind of the schedule we're working towards and the general overview. And I'll have uh, Ms. Smith come up and cover the rest of it and then ask for a hearing to be opened. Maybe you want a hearing open to officially before we do that? I guess I'll defer. We have to make a motion to open. It's just open and we make a motion to close. Correct? You can open. Okay. So the public hearing is open. Okay. It's already open. I want to ask the question. If you get a chance, this was your response about local. All right. Hi, guys. You can hear me? All right. So I'm just going to go over kind of some high level <laughs> topics of the rec plan. First, why do you have a five year rec plan? It's to create an inventory of your existing facilities and resources to identify community recreation open space needs, set a plan of action for the next five years, and as Leo said, apply for grants. The state of Michigan requires that you have a five-year rec plan on file that gets updated every five years in order to apply for grants. Um, the city of Muskegon has 41 neighborhood and community parks, 400 acres, and it has a surplus of acreage um, on community and neighborhood parks, about 12. It's a my little surplus. You have, based on your population size, you have enough acres of parkland to fulfill the needs of the community. And the one thing, you should probably add some more trails, connecting the parks and expanding the The recreation facilities like basketball courts, soccer fields, playgrounds, those meet the current standards on how many you should have for the city, for the city population. And then the community survey, which I don't know, have you had a chance to look at it? It's very interesting. No? All right. So the majority of the comments, um, the most utilized park is Pier Marquette, then Hackley, Cruz, and Beechwood, which you would expect. The parks that the public would most likely see expanded are, or improved, mostly improved. The Grand Trunk Long Tramp, Cruzy Park, Margaret Elliott Drake, Marshfield, McGraft, and Pier Marquette. The most utilized, or the um, people ask for more accessibility to Lake Michigan. In general. And um, the activities that the public would like to see expanded or added playgrounds, water, water splash pads, natural areas, and biking trails and walking trails as well. And then when asked how your public money should be spent on the parks um, versus acquiring new um, developing, developing new, or expanding the existing. Um, they wanted to upgrade the existing park facilities and maintain what you have. So not necessarily any new parks, but just taking care of what you have. And then some other comments at the very end. A skate park is needed. Lakeshore connectivity and improvements are needed. More lighted pickleball. More amenities at the parks, um, especially Pier Marquette, restrooms, shelters. Winter trails, like following some trails in the wintertime. And um, at all of the parks, the majority of the improvements are renovation, remove and replace, and accessibility improvements, which Leo started re replacing some of the playgrounds. But all of the parks are aging, and they all really kind of need a facelift. And the next steps is the resolution of adoption after the public comments. And you have that. And, and then my assistant tomorrow will madly insert the <laughs> and get it to the DNR before February 1st. Do you have any questions? No, no you questions for me right this moment, but um, 
Are the public going to come up and do the pre questions? Yes, I'm going to welcome the public up to give their, their input. Um, and then I'm going to, we'll, ref, we'll hold off on the questions from the commission until we close the public hearing and are deliberating on the motion and resolution itself. And so that's when we'll present any questions to you um, or to our, our DPW director. Okay. At this time, I'm going to open it up to uh, public comment and uh, input from our residents. And any non-residents who are neighbors that may be interested in moving to this magnificent city. All right, so we have two people who have registered to speak. Uh, first of whom is Wendy Hanna. Miss Hanna. Yes, please. Uh, come up and give your name and address, and you have uh, three minutes to give your remarks. My name is Wenda Hanna. My address is 2293 Moon Street. Um, I noticed when I was going through the Parks and Recreation Plan that there is no mention of the Charter Park Ordinance and I would really like to see that in there. I can't even go through that plan and pick out which of the parks are Charter Parks based on the way that this is organized. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much. That's a great uh, input, a uh, great point. And so, I, uh, Leo, Director Evans, you want to speak to that as to you know, us incorporating uh, language with regard to the charter park system and which parks fall into that system? Yeah, we can definitely incorporate that. We, had, um, we have a GIS person on staff in the engineering department that's off on maternity leave that created uh, maps of the legal descriptions of all the charter parks that we can insert those into the plan pretty easily. So. All right, excellent. Issue. Thank you. And... Next up, we have Tom Weatherby. Mr. Weatherby, if you come up, give your name and address, and you have three minutes uh, to provide your input. Uh, good evening, Tom Weatherby, uh, 1747 Edgewater Street. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'd like to share with you a little bit about myself and my background. I was born and raised in Muskegon, and being retired, I spend most of my summer days at the beach. The beach is the reason I moved back to Muskegon. It has been mentioned that the city empl employs experts in what they do and it puts the commission in a tight spot because you need to incorporate the voices of the, in, of the residents with, with your, resident, with your um, experts. As a, as a resident who ha was a commercial architect for 32 years, I too feel that I have some expertise in this area. While I was involved in many aspects of architecture and the design process, my real niche in that firm was codes, especially as they pertain, pertain to barrier-free. So I do feel strongly about advocating for more accessibility. Being both a beach enthusiast and an architect, I feel I can offer a unique perspective in regard, regarding the design of the proposed walkway on Pier Marquette Beach. Tonight, I'd like to uh, address three topics. Uh, first is the walkway width. I still have some concerns that the proposed 16 foot wide walkway is excessive. I, I have done some research and have provided you with seven uh, separate design guidelines from mun municipalities from all around the country. And they all use 10 feet as a common width and I remind you that the walkway from downtown to the beach is 10 feet, also 10 feet wide. Wider walkways are only needed when the user volume exceeds 300 total users in an hour. This averages out to be five users per minute, or one user every 12 seconds, which is not the volume of users we have in Muskegon. A study should be done to verify the volume of users, and that science should be used to determine the width of the walkway. The guideline I like best is from the American Association of State Highways and Transportation Officials because it not only gives you guidelines, but it explains the reasoning behind them. It states that due to the fact that nearly all shared use pathways are used by pedestrians, they fall under the accessibility requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The technical provisions herein either meet or exceed those recommendations in current accessibility guidelines. If you wanted to, you could always advocate for a greater amount of accessibility by increasing the width from the recommended 10 feet for the walkway to even 12 feet. 
Second topic is striping of the walkway. These guidelines do not recommend striping of this walkway. The American Associate, well, same, same uh, example, states that under the, most conditions, there is no need to segregate pedestrians from bicyclic, bicyclists on a shared use pathway, even in areas with high user volumes. They can typically coexist. Path users customarily keep, uh, I guess my time is up. Uh, I still have one more topic. Uh, I guess I'll just uh, send a, a letter to you guys. Um, well, we did receive, I, I received your email yesterday, uh, as well as the attachments. Um, reviewed those, those documents into the wee hours of the morning, along with the, the survey results from our, uh, our Parks and Rec uh, uh, master plan. And so we've received the documents, received your email. If you do have follow-up, um, we welcome. I do, I do have additional follow-up. Give I'll... additional comment during public comment at the end of our meeting. At the end of the meeting. Yeah, you're Thank welcome you to much. continue your comments. And sorry to, to cut right. you off I right now. I get it all in, so. But I appreciate your passion and your input, Mr. Weatherby. Right. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak on our update to our five-year master plan for parks and recreation? All right, I see um, Ms. Dehudi in the back. Uh, no, that's fine. If you want to, uh, you can still turn it in if you want to speak at the end of our meeting on, on another topic, um, but you're welcome to come up to speak with regard to our updates to our master parks and rec plan. Um, Darlene Dehudi, 4356 Lake Harbor Road, Norton Shores. Um, I definitely con concur with Mr. Weatherby, and I would like to know why his plan wasn't implemented, implemented to begin with because it would have saved the beach from having the concrete path in the first place. National standards are set for a reason as our laws, and they're based on experts. I really recommend, as I have already, that we follow those national standards. That's what Mr. Weatherby has suggested. Mr. Hulka has suggested it. I have suggested it and also based it on the fact that states around the United States are also using those standards. 16 is not that standard. So also in regard to what Ms. Hannah said, um, yes, include the fact of the charter parks and, and designate which they are and also add what the charter parks amendment means to those parks. And also, if you would add the critical dunes ordinance, the city passed, which I can't find it anywhere on your site to read it. Um, those laws are state laws that protect the dunes, critical dune areas. Those need to be followed as well. People shouldn't be deciding things based on personal opinion. They should be decided on fact. And also what was recommended was that there be a use study, which usually precludes any engineering plans or construction, and I really would like to see that done as well. <laughs> I guess that just about covers it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoody. Appreciate your input. Um, Mr. Franzik, real quick, uh, which chapter does the critical dunes ordinance uh, and our code ordinance, where would it be? So we can direct Mr. Hoodie and others to it. I don't know the section number off the top of my head, but it's in the regular section of the zoning ordinance. So if you go to the planning department's section, under development services, go down to zoning. There's three options. There's the zoning ordinance, the form-based code, and the lakeside form-based code. And you just go to the zoning ordinance. Okay. I just want to direct her to the right place, make sure she has the information she's looking for. Um, all right. Gotcha. All right. Mr. Hoodie, I have your email address, so I will shoot you an email with um, the link to that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Franzik. Mr. Paletti, I saw your hand up a minute ago. Would you like to give a comment? 
Paletti. Dr. Paletti. Yeah, it's 3244 Thompson Avenue, Muskegon, Michigan. My, uh, my point um, has to do with we're voting on something we don't know what the map of that trail system is. And um, I, I ride my bike down there a lot. I've got a recreation uh, degree as well. And um, I've got video of the beach at peak times that doesn't show a big amount of traffic. And so I just think that if we can contribute to planning the pathway. I talked to the TART people up in Traverse City, a beautiful trail system. Sometimes trails have to be wide, but the place that it needs to be widest happens to be in the place that it can't be widest, which is in front of the restaurant and um, the beachfront. So, and then the other piece of it is we've had a fatality. We're going to have more accidents because we're encouraging more traffic to the beach. We want more accessibility, but when you have more cars and you combine that with alcohol, we're going to have problems. And somebody's going to pay. It's going to either be our city or the restaurant or whatever. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paletti. Any other members of the public wish to give comment on the update to our five-year Parks and Rec plan? No? All right. Entertain a motion to close the public hearing. And adopt the resolution. I move to close the public hearing, support the five-year parks and recreation plan, and authorize the mayor and clerk to sign a resolution in support of the plan. Support. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner St. Clair, supported by Commissioner Hood, to close the public hearing and approve the five-year parks and recreation plan and authorize the mayor and clerk to sign a resolution in support of that plan. So, commissioners, do you have any questions or input for Director Evans at this time? Yes, Vice yeah. Mayor German. Yeah, just uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, we talked uh, about and heard about what the parks would consist of with improvements and stuff like that. Has there been any consideration with um, type of infrastructure like um, Wi-Fi or anything like that? Does the grant allow any type of uh, infrastructure like that? I don't know the specific requirements of the DNR grants if Wi-Fi is a permissible use or not um, it is certainly something we can look into I don't know that it's specifically referenced in the plan either though it could be added if it's a desire um, we've done a little bit of preliminary work at Hackley Park to undertake some electrical upgrades in the future and we did include provisions in that design for Wi-Fi expansion uh, but primarily because the county library approached us about expanding their Wi-Fi network through the park. So, yes, if there's a desire, it could be added, and the eligibility, I'm not sure, but it certainly doesn't hurt us to have it in the plan. I don't. Yeah, yeah I, I really think that would be a great addition to the parks, and the community would definitely appreciate that. So, don't hurt to check into it. So, I appreciate that. Thank you, Vice Mayor German, and I concur on that regard. Uh, touch base with Leo just before our meeting on that. So I'm grateful to, to hear uh, uh, your support for that. Also, and any other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner St. Clair. I am wondering if going forward there is a possibility for this to become more of a living document than something that we work on every five years. Um, I know that there's been a lot of feedback from the community that the plan is very much checking the boxes that we need to check without really embodying where we want to go with the community in regards to climate change, in regards to population shift. Um, you know, there are things that we would have never thought of five years ago that have suddenly become a very big issue. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if there is a possibility to look at this being, as I said, a living document going forward, or is this a one and done thing? Uh, you no, know, it certainly can be a living document. I think we maybe touched briefly on it at the work session that I don't know that there's anything that would restrict us from submitting an update prior to the five-year plan expiring. You know, if we wanted to do a new five-year plan in two years, we could do that. Um, two things I'll bring up and mention here. 
Uh, I just accepted the resignation of our park supervisor uh, last week, so we are going to be without a park supervisor in the future and going to be needing to fill that spot, so we're going to be a little short of leadership there for a while. Uh, the second is I did also just submit an item for discussion at one of the February meetings in regards to the creation of a Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, so I think that'll be on the CRC agenda for February. Um, we just kind of laid out a draft proposal based on the old Leisure Services Board of what the membership would look like, what the meetings would look like, what the, the charge and direction of that board would be. And uh, one of the features is certainly updating that five-year plan and being responsible to be the leadership for that. So, Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner St. Clair, and thank you, Director Evans, on that. Um, I'm excited to, for us to be exploring that as our CRC and reviving uh, that uh, Parks and Rec uh, Advisory Committee uh, and to, to help us when we do, whether it's a living document or a more frequent update uh, to that plan, that we can engage that, that committee of citizens to help us then solicit more feedback um, from folks throughout our throughout our city because while I appreciate the hundred and some people that responded to the survey uh, for this update I would like us to do a more a deeper dive more comprehensive engagement uh, with our citizens across our city and have a more representative sample uh, to inform our, our parks and rec priorities and, and allocation of funding um, and capital improvements so um, thank you any other questions or input on this right now um, just just as a in addition to the to the Wi-Fi situation adding to our parks, it'd be nice if we can get um, more shelters. I know we've already been doing that. You know, at Buchamo, we're looking at adding a shelter. We just did one at Emmett Park, but it would be nice to um, have more shelters in our, in our neighborhood parks across the city to provide um, for a number of different reasons. But very good. Thank you. All right. If there's nothing else from the dais, we'll proceed with roll call. <coughs> Commissioner St. Clair. Yes. Mayor Johnson. Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor German? Yes. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? Yes. Motion passes. All right. We're on to new business. Item A, amendment to the form base code. We've got Mr. Franzik joining us. Do we have a motion to proceed? I move to approve the request to amend the form based code urban residential and lakeside residential context areas of the zoning ordinance to reduce the minimum side setback at non street locations requirement from six to five feet and reduce the side build to zone at side street from 10, 25, 10 to 25 feet to five to 25 feet. Support. All right, we have a motion from Commissioner Gorman. Supported by Commissioner Hood to approve the request to amend the form based code urban residential and lakeside residential context areas of the zoning ordinance to reduce the minimum side setback at non street locations, requirement from six to five feet, and reduce the side built to zone at side street from 10 to 25 feet to five to 25 feet. All right. Mr. Franzik, if you could report out on this item, please. Sure. So uh, we have three different single family type zonings in the city R1, R2, and R3. Those are based off the width of your lot. Now, um, R1s are larger type lots, uh, 50 foot wide or larger. Uh, we have larger setbacks uh, required in those districts because there's more room to play with. Uh, you can still fit a large home on there and still have uh, separation from your neighbors. You have more, more room to play with for that. R2, uh, it gets a little more dense, 40 foot wide is all you need to have. Uh, and then the setbacks come down a little bit from there. Now, R3 is our most dense uh, single family zoning. And you can build on lots that are only up to 33, uh, 30 foot wide. And those setbacks are only required to have five foot side setbacks. And that's really important because when you're developing on a narrow lot, like a 30 foot lot, you really don't have a lot of room to play with. So whoever owns that lot, they want to develop on it, they're really at a disservice and they have less options to choose from in terms of housing types. Um, it also could affect um, the visibility and even ADA requirements when you don't have as enough room to play with. Uh, and the International Building Code only requires that homes be 10 feet apart without having to have special building types. Um, dense glass is a 
type of building product that is used when um, houses are, are less than 10 feet apart. And that can be quite costly when you start getting into that. So many of our lots in the city were developed on 33 foot wide parcels. And our form based code allows you to build on those, just like the R3 district. Same in terms of the building or the parcel width, you only need to have 30 foot of width. Uh, but the form based code says you have to have six foot side setback. Uh, we're recommending that we just bring that down to five feet uh, because it will still meet the international fire uh, building code uh, for that, giving you that 10 foot separation. And really, that only extra one foot you're losing isn't really going to do much terms of privacy and that's really why we have these setbacks um, in the city is to give a little bit more privacy that's easier to achieve when you have a 50 foot wide lot but when you're down to a 30 foot wide lot you're already pretty close so our rationale to be able to to develop these lots and develop uh, higher quality homes on these lots would to just bring that um, setback uh, reduce it by one additional foot. Thank you Mr. Franzik. Commissioners, do you have any questions or input on this amendment? Yes, Vice Mayor German. Yes, thank you, Mayor Johnson. Um, Mr. Francis, uh, thank you for addressing this. Um, now, this uh, amendment is strictly just for the lakeside area. Or this is just cross the board for the whole form based code. It's for for any parcel, speaking. any parcel that's <clears throat> zoned form-based code or lakeside form-based code. So we have two districts. We have our downtown form-based code, which encompasses some of the downtown neighborhoods, some areas of those. Mm -hmm. And then there's another form-based code we adopted a few years later in Lakeside. Okay. Now, and I'm talking about the other neighborhoods like um, Nims, Jackson Hill. Would this affect those areas? There's no parcel zone form-based code in Jackson Hill. Nelson has some parcels. All of Nelson is form based code. Okay. <coughs> and the portion of NIMS has urban residential context area. Yes, the northern portion of NIMS does as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess my um, thought process when I think ab about this, I, I, one of the major concerns that I hear uh, in Ward 2 um, is the problem with the density that would occur if, you know, this form based code would was passed and allowed this type of um, um, amendment if it was to just kind of snowball into the other areas. Um, most of the citizens that I've talked to, again, don't like the fact that their houses are, or would be close, especially um, five feet apart. Um, this doesn't affect them in that sense right now. But I guess I'm looking um, down the line in the future. Would this be something that the city would be recommending for the other neighborhoods, such as a Jackson Hill, uh, McLaughlin, Nims, um, Angel? Yeah, so that rezoning, you know, we've had discussions on that for the past couple years. So if we bring that uh, back to you uh, for consideration, then this code would apply to that. Yeah. And, it, and this is something that they don't want. They've expressed that publicly. And um, so, you know, this is why, you, you know, I haven't heard from anyone in the Lakeside um, area that opposes this. I'm not sure. And that's, um, I guess, Commissioner Emery's um, ward over there. So I really wouldn't have any insight on how they feel. Um, but I, I just wanted to address that that concern with some of the other neighborhoods. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, it is. Chairman? Commissioners? Any other questions or input on this matter? One more thing I, I yes. forgot to state. Uh, also on the corner lot setbacks, uh, that's another big one. Um, right now it says you have to build least 10 feet off of the side lot line and, um, a corner lot 
that makes it really difficult uh, when you're dealing with a 30 or 33 foot wide lot because then there's another additional five foot. So it's really making those corner lots unbuildable. So mm -hmm. um, the front setbacks have a wide range you can do. You can do from 10 to 25 feet. So there's other options to make sure you have clear corner vision. You could push that house back. So I just wanted to bring that up as well. Thank you, Mr. Franzik. Yes. Let's see. Go okay. Commissioner Vice Emmer. Mayor asked me, uh, only a very small section of Lakeside is farm based code, and that is the business area. None of the residential area is farm based code. There's a there, there is homes. Yeah. A few, yeah, a very small portion. So from Denmark, I have it right here. From in the orange mm -hmm. is the Lakeside urban residential context area, or Lakeside residential. I mean, there's another urban resident, lakeside residential context here. And that goes from uh, Denmark to Estes, and basically it's Harrison to Minor. Um, and there's a little bit on the lakeward side of Harrison, but it's pretty much Denmark to Estes, Harrison to Minor. That is the right. lakeside residential context area for our form based code. And to Commissioner German's point, um, you know, portions of Jackson Hill are zoned R3. Mm -hmm. So even if it doesn't get rezoned to form based code in the future, uh, those areas that are already R3 still enjoy that five-foot setback uh, requirement. So. And, and what about uh, side by side? Is that just a five-foot setback? But And on the side, does that apply also to those that are three zoning? Yeah, like it's a five-foot side oh, oh, setback. Okay, five. Okay. So the houses would be about 10 feet apart. And this went through the Planning Commission? They yeah, the Planning it? Commission recommended approval by a six to one vote. All right. Last chance for questions or input, commissioners? All right. Um, I kind of gone back and forth. I completely understand the, um, the built the zone for the side. I kind of went back and forth with regard to reducing the minimum side setback. I had heard some of the same concerns as uh, Commissioner German about, and, I, and I've heard Commissioner Emery express previously as well in terms of um, building too close, and getting too dense, and the impact on, on quality of life and residents in that regard. However, in the current areas that we have urban residential context and lakeside residential, uh, they were built with that density historically. And so I don't see this tweaking as a major deviation from the historical norm. In fact, I think it aligns with the with the historical norm for these areas. So, um, I will be supporting this. I will say this gives me greater pause about expanding this specific context area into other neighborhoods that we may not have seen that historical uh, pattern of build out there. So, it may give me pause in that regard, but I can support uh, this amendment as uh, presented today. So. Unless uh, there are final chance, commissioners, for input or questions before we go to roll call. Or uh, if uh, Mr. Franzik has any final thoughts to share. All right. Did I see your hand? Yeah. Vice yeah. And, yeah. And to concur with what you're saying, um, uh, Mayor Johnson, um, looking at the neighborhood and the historical value of it, um, you know, I just don't um, really know um, enough or haven't got input from citizens in Lakeside. Um, but that, again, the concern that this would actually expand to other areas based on the presence of doing this um, here, um, that gives me huge concerns when listening to the public in the community um, of some of the other neighborhoods. Um, so um, that's why, you know, I, I do caution um, moving forward with some of this stuff until I hear more from um, the public, and if I had heard from the public in Lakeside, I would feel more comfortable um, voting in favor of something like this. Yes, Commissioner St. Clair. I actually live in the form based code area of Lakeside. I didn't realize it until tonight. That's how much it's not a problem for us. <laughs> um, you know, it's already a pretty densely populated neighborhood. If I uh, wanted to, I could chuck something from my deck onto my neighbor's deck, but we have fences. Um, and uh, I don't know that there's any vacant property even in that form-based code area in Lakeside that 
could be built out anyway. So um, just uh, informational. Um, but yep, I'm smack in the middle of it and I didn't even know it. So. Well, thank you for that additional context, mm -hmm. Commissioner St. Clair. All right. If there's, oh, did you have something, Commissioner Hood, to share? No? All right. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor German? Uh, no. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? No. Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Motion passes. All right. Item B. Thank you, Mr. Franzik. Item B, Mercy Health Arena Floor Scrubber. I move to approve the purchase of a floor scrubber from Pacific Floor Care at a cost not to exceed $21,774.69. Support. Support. Yeah. All right, we have a, a motion by uh, Commissioner Gorman and supported by Commissioner Hood. Uh, to approve the purchase of a floor scrubber from Pacific Floor Care at a cost not to exceed $21,774.69. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to lead out on this, but I would like at least to do an introduction to Jake LeMay. Jake's our new arena director, and I won't make him get up and go to the podium, but if those of you haven't had a chance to meet him, Jake's sitting in the back there giving me the evil eye for calling him out <laughs> at the meeting. Um, but I'll, I'll, be, I'll be really... He, he, sa he saved you, Jake. I was going to call you up. <laughs> I could see the look on his face. It was he was going to go for the door. Um, so, the amount of cleaning that has to happen in that arena, especially now during the during the COVID pandemic, it's it's just it's gotten almost a little out of hand. And we have we've always had the old handheld you know push behind floor scrubber, and but we went from having to scrub that that concourse like once every couple of weeks to pretty much every single night we're scrubbing it. And we've essentially killed that piece of machinery. It does it. I don't think it even works anymore. I think they've been hand mopping um, until we could get this on the agenda. But essentially what we're trying to purchase here locally from a Muskegon company, uh, uh, actually ride a rideable one, which we think will cut the concourse cleaning time by hours, um, which will be good. Um, so they can spend more time doing, you know, taking care of the bathrooms and the other stuff that just doesn't get done in the overnight hours. And then we'll buy a new walk behind one that'll specifically um, go down in the lower level. So clean the, the locker rooms and, you know, in kind of the private areas down there. So we are looking to spend $21,774. Um, I've had a conversation with FEMA and they think that although this is kind of a large purchase, um, it probably has some level of eligibility for reimbursement from the original CARES Act um, allocation. And so I'm going to submit to that. And they've, they've changed that from an 80% to 100%. So if it does get approved, I can probably get most all this returned to us. Um, but I won't know until, until I make the formal sub submittal. But either way, it really, it's, it's, a, it's a necessity down there. And um, I'll s speak for Donnie, who is our overnight janitor. I think that when this shows up, he'll probably shed a tear um, <laughs> because he'll actually be able to get his job done. Yeah. It, All right. And then last thing, Pacific uh, Floor Scrubbers. Um, Floor Care is a Muskegon-based company. They're over on Sheridan. They're in the city limits, and so this will be um, um, built by them and provided to us um, locally. So we won't we won't have to go out of the city to get this. And I think they can have it here in days, so we'll have it this week. Great. Excellent. Commissioner Gorman. Oh, yeah, I was yeah. just gonna say I'm just glad the arena is getting used that much, um, and I I think we can all appreciate keeping that concourse. Um, as many people are coming there for the first time in a while, I want to make sure they have the best impression of that beautiful arena now. So, yeah, and, and actually, I'll, I'll piggyback on that one more time. We've been really limiting the walking in there. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we can't, we just can't keep up with this, with the salt and things that they track through there. And so, hopefully, this will make it a lot easier to where now we can open the arena back up potentially and let people walk in there again. Because I don't think we've let people walk in yet this this winter. We just haven't been. We just can't accommodate them. Mm -hmm. Nice. So what do you think the outlook might be for that? Well, let's, like see how, soon. let's see how it goes. Probably, you know, let, let's see how it goes. Let, let's get the arena maintenance opinion on it and then Jake's opinion on it. And um, if we can open it up soon, we'll, we'll make an announcement. I, I know people are chomping at the bit to yeah. get in there and do it. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions or input? No? All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Vice Mayor German? Yes. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? Yes. Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Motion passes. All right, item C, sales agreement for 2725 Oltoff. 
I move to approve the sale agreement and authorize the mayor and clerk to sign. Support. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Hood, supported by Commissioner Gorman, to approve the sales agreement, authorize the mayor and clerk to sign for 2725 Oltoff. All right, city manager, you leading out on this? Yep, yep, sure, I'll lead out on this. So for those of you who who are, or maybe aren't up to speed on this particular property, this is a, a former uh, correctional facility that the city heard was closing and we kind of were proactive and we stepped up with the help again of our um, of our uh, state senator and um, we were able to procure it and what, what came with it were a number of grants to get the property ready to go for for redevelopment so we 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 purchased it they gave us money to tear down the facility and then there was about a four million dollar um, um, state enhancement grant designed to um, to get the site um, redevelopment ready and so we've uh, we've gone through that process. I think we took ownership of it in 2019. Pete Wills and Leo Evans worked through the process. If you recall, we did some um, some clearing of the site maybe about, I don't know, six or eight months ago, removed the trees and things like that. Um, this is our first um, um, of, I think, three really viable end users for the site. Um, and we're excited to um, see this investment um, uh, happen in Muskegon. Um, is essentially an expansion, uh, a relocation and expansion of an existing Muskegon County company um, that allow them to, to do their job um, a little more efficiently. And um, for us, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars of new um, property tax income. It's likely tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of new income tax revenue. It's, it's an, gonna be an important piece of the, of the local economy and we're excited to see the investment. All right, thank you, Mr. Manager. Yes, um, well, first I'd like to, um, the motion was made by Commissioner Hood, so I want to give him the opportunity to um, lead out with any questions or input, if you don't mind, Commissioner Emery. I don't have any um, any input on this, except for it's, it's um, promising that we've got someone ready to come in there and um, generate some jobs and tax revenue. Thank you, Commissioner Hood. Right. And I uh, was supported by Commissioner Gorman, so I'm just going to give her the opportunity as well. Um, so, Commissioner Gorman, as the supporter of that motion, do you have any questions or input at this time? No. All right. Uh, Commissioner Emery, thank you for your patience. Thank you. Okay, thank you um, to our city manager for letting me know this answered a lot of my questions that we had $4 million in grants and um, to purchase it and then grants to demo it. Because I <clears throat> looked up and, you know, I did my arithmetic last night. We paid over a, a little over a million dollars for the property and then we're, which is about 21000 per acre and then we're selling it for 1500 per acre and I was questioning that. So thank you because that answers my biggest question. Um, and what about the, yeah, a lot of people have reached out with concerns about us paying for all of the, um, the utilities. Yep. So, um, so what, one thing to remember is it's a 60 acre site. And so, uh, the utilities essentially stop at the beginning of the site. So for us, there are some expenses to make sure there's roadways to get to all the parcels that we're going to build. We got to make sure that there's that there's water and sewer to service the parcels and electric and gas to service the parcels. Those are really going to be the public improvements. Anything that these folks would use on their private site, on that 20-acre site, will be paid for by them. So this is no different than, for example, as part of that $4 million grant that we had, we repaved Old Hoff and we repaved Sheridan. Um, it was like $715,000. So it's very similar to that. So we did not want to extend Old Hoff until we knew what was going where. It just didn't make a, make a lot of sense. So we held on to about $500,000, a little less of that money, to help um, um, extend those uh, services. Now, we don't have an exact number, um, mostly because we know of one. This is the one. Um, but there's probably room for three, maybe four total um, large-scale operations on the site, not all doing the same thing as this particular one. Um, but we're only going to build the public infrastructure that we need 
for this one for now. And the place that they've taken, if you look at uh, the exhibit that shows the piece that, that they're using, it's essentially the northern, mo northeastern most part of it. So we'll have to extend Oltoff um, to that site and then and then bring the water and sewer lines under the prison fence and then probably bring some electrical and gas lines to the site too. But the nice thing is all that money that we put into that, it's not really for these folks. It sounds like it is today because they're the first one, right? Mm -hmm. But now on uh, to the south of this new road that we put in, there will be another 25 plus acres for additional investment just like this that we won't have to make this, you know, this investment for. Mm -hmm. Now, if we want to access the, I think there's about 20 acres in Fruitport. That's part of this pro you know, property. If we want to access those, and that's when there will be some expense to turn that road and head south down down in the fruit port. But right now, we don't have any intention to to carry the road down there. For the right investment, we certainly would. Okay, thank you. I I am, um, you know, I'm I have real mixed emotions as an animal lover. Um, I'm ex and yet a city of Muskegon lover. I love that we're having these people are wanting to invest in our back into our city because they were in our city mm -hmm. and moved out and want to now come back. And yet I, as someone who trudged through, trudged um, about 30 yards through two feet of snow this morning to rescue a frozen cat, I have that concern as to what kind of business wants to develop in our, in our city again. So thank you though. We, um, if, that, if it helps us, uh, Jake and I did have a tour of the existing facility. Um, you know, we're, you know, we're, we learned about a lot of the licensing and the oversight and the things like that. And we also learned a lot about what the end product is, what the end result is. And it's 100% medical based. It's not about cosmetology. It's not about anything like that. It's about helping people with you know, whether it's Parkinson's and, you know, and other things like that, that really do need to be dealt with at the, at the human level. And, and I think we walked out of that, I won't speak ridiculous, we walked out of it feeling very comfortable that the investment that we saw, one, it's going to happen somewhere because that this is a key piece of, of moving, you know, moving, advancing, med you know, medicine. Um, so it's going to happen someplace, whether it's Muskegon or, or one of the surrounding areas or a different state. And from our standpoint, it made a lot of sense to make sure it happens here so our community can, can ha reap the economic benefit of it, but also so we can maybe see how we can benefit the medical sector with the knowledge that exists here in Muskegon. So there'll be opportunities for, for local people to work there. Um, they're really interested in getting, you know, Getting a, getting a hold of Muskegon graduates and getting them introduced into these jobs, which by the way, on average, I think was $80,000, you know, was the average pay. It's really a lot different than what we're, you know, you know, we've, you know, we hear from the community aid, hey, stop building, you know, condos and build jobs, you mm -hmm. know, and, and this is a good example of an opportunity where there's professional, there's doctors, there's veterinarians, there's vet techs, there's really good paying jobs that will be here that will support the community and the community will support. How many jobs will this? Oh, so on the, on the high side, you know, there's a potential for two, I think right around 200 jobs on the high side. Um, Jake's raised his hand, so he probably wants to answer that question, but I think there's a potential for some new jobs and some, tran and some transferred in jobs. How many animals are they going to kill? Jake, did you have an answer? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, Director Eckholm, I'm sorry. Does he want to come to the podium? Oh, do you, could you come to the, so that everyone can hear you at, at home and um, in the audience as well? Good evening. Um, I assisted the organization with their application to the State of Michigan uh, Economic Development Corporation, and their long-term uh, between retained and expanded jobs was, I believe, a top out of 400. But I think that's within the next decade. So that's their anticipation. I know... There's, I think, 70-ish full-time employees now. They would retain and move those to this new site over time, and then I think within the next couple of years, add an additional um, 50 plus minus position. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as part of this agreement and and in trade off for the, the purchase uh, price is that they're going to be investing $40 million minimum as well as creating 50 jobs minimum, but we, we there's good reason to expect 
that that investment is going to be considerably higher, and the job creation will be considerably considerably higher. Yes. Yeah, so the the proposed initial site plan uh, calls for roughly 125,000 square feet of build out in potentially two phases, and then the long term build out plan is to double that space to a total of 250,000 square feet. Okay. And then the the infrastructure build out that uh, Commissioner Emery was inquiring about earlier, and we heard that we're going to be paying for that, but there was also going to be servicing other um, potential end users. Um, along that way. So it's not being built out solely for accommodating um, this buyer, but all the users along that property. Can you speak to where we're at in terms of uh, programming or selling that that other property, which yeah. would shoulder, help shoulder the cost ultimately of this? Because those eligible, those would be brownfield eligible expenses for reimbursement over time from these uh, uh, property owners. Correct? Yes, so um, just to kind of bear down on the costs in that you know million dollar estimate so the remaining grant funds would be used towards that end but in addition to that one of the Which big costs half million dollars yeah so roughly four hundred eighty thousand okay. dollars but one of the big costs that we're going to have to pay one way or the other if we have any larger commercial manufacturing user out there is extending the higher loads uh, higher voltage electric like three phase electric to the site and that has to be done regardless um so whenever we get somebody in there whether it's this or another investor we're going to have to do that um and typically you know if there's a public public run in the public right of way that cost is typically borne by the, the community. Um, now that being said, as, as city manager Peterson correctly pointed out, um, they're going to cover all the costs on their actual site. So our goal would be to bring it to bear for everyone so that then they could connect to it. Um, now I do want to caveat that a portion of the site is quite a ways south and in Fruitport Township. Um, we're working towards uh, potential investment there and also working towards trying to negotiate a multi-jurisdictional, a shared jurisdictional agreement with Fruitport Township. Um, so those folks, you know, we there may be an ask later to, to cost share to get that electrical from Old Hoff right of way down to that site. I have not gotten that ask yet. Mm -hmm. But just for the sake of transparency, I want to let you know, like, there may be an ask for costs later down the line from another user, and we'll have to consider that as a community when that comes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Director Eckholm. Thank you. Commissioners? Yes, Vice Mayor German. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, yeah, and I want to thank Frank for um, clarifying things in your email. Um, and to the concerns of uh, this economic development project, I think it's really huge. And you know, being on the commission about ten years, um, we've seen a huge loss of revenue um, from companies um, like BC Cobbs, you know, that tax base. And we always, as you mentioned, talked about jobs, and this is an opportunity to really uh, bring some jobs here in the city of Muskegon and good-paying jobs. You know. I don't know much about this research uh, center, and I, I do share the sentiment of cat lovers and dog lovers and animal lovers. Um, I'm just hoping that this is nothing that will set a precedence for some type of animal cruelty or anything like that, um, because um, I like pets too. So um, don't have any, but um, I know a lot of people that do. Um, Given the fact that it will, you know, give us a tax base and create jobs, just to give people an opportunity to just really have a a life where they can feel comfortable and sustained. Um, is there? And I, I would prefer, even if the actual developer himself was here, or and I guess he's not here, or couldn't make comments or anything. Additional questions could be asked of him. Exactly what? it entails um, with this type of research facility. Um, is that something that we can get back from him or those type of questions? Or will there be any um, animals um, being put to rest just for this research or, or what? Are they just taking samples? Um, these are the unknowns, you know, that I would like to know about. Um, <clears throat> my, my guess is, is if you're interested, they would probably afford you the same courtesy that they afforded um, Director Eckholm and myself to, to visit the facility and learn more about about what they do and why they do it and what the out, what the outcomes are. I think they would be, be more than happy to to allow that. And if that's what you want to do, we can mm -hmm. probably set that up. Yeah, um, but but see, and the reason I'm asking because we have to take a vote tonight, right, mm -hmm. on yeah. this. So, 
we'll be voting tonight on the the sale agreement. Sale agreement, uh, right? There's another step that's required for essentially um, triggering the ultimate closing, which is providing um, a review of the commercial redevelopment um, exemption. So that'll be down the road. It'll be part and parcel with this. Okay. Well, is it possible that next um, phase that comes up, the developer or who's uh, in charge of this uh, project could be present or do a um, Zoom can, where we I can, can ask, ask questions and stuff like that? I think that'd be good to connect um, the the company with all of the commissioners yes, and yes. Um, have them accommodate any tours that commissioners would like to take. And then when we do get to the point of evaluating um, that uh, commercial redevelopment exemption, which will go through our uh, scoring system that we have, just like any other um, abatement, um, perhaps that's an opportunity for the developer to, to be here in person for, for that meeting. Mm -hmm. Just one last question. Okay, and when we talk about, you know, abatements and um, capturing tax credits, does that include, like, school taxes, and public school taxes also? Yeah, we're, might... yeah, an abatement would essentially cut them in half, everybody equally. So this, we would have, we would all share in the, in the abatement, all the taxing entities would. Yeah. Um, the school district here is Orchard View. It's not Muskegon Public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. And that would be an abatement on the future uh, tax growth. Yeah. So presently, as empty property um, owned, by and as owned by the city, it's not generating any <laughs> exactly. uh, tax revenue. It probably this time. it probably never has. If you consider the prison no. and the state owned it for many, many, many years, decades, this has not generated any you know really any property taxes for the city. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just wanted to address a couple um, comments that I heard. One of which was regard to you know being cat lovers or cat friendly. Just to be clear, this facility does not have cats, according to. Um, what I'm reading here, and from your tour, did you see any cats on site? So it does not appear that there are any cats. Just wanted to clarify that because that got brought up, so there would be no confusion. Um, in terms of animal welfare, uh, they are a highly regulated institution. Um, they are over uh, governed by the um, FDA's Good Laboratory Practice, as well as the National Institutes of Health Office of Laboratory Animal Welfare, as well as... Um, the USDA licensed and inspected on a regular basis, DEA licensed, and also accredited by the AAA LAC, uh, which is an international accreditation program that evaluates organizations using animals in research, teaching, or testing. Um, since, since could you speak to Mr. Um, Mr. Peterson with regard to life sciences, because we realize and understand that animal research is a piece of that, uh, but that's not the sole activity that happens there um, in terms of what this company does. And they're already doing it in, in our county, we used to be doing it in our city, mm -hmm. and so we be returning to, to our city. Um, can you speak to a bit in terms of you know, the work that they do? Yeah, so I'm not... I'm not as knowledgeable um, because I'm just not educated in, in all those things. But one thing we do know is that the type of um, treatments that, that, that they do are, are important. One of the biggest things I know they're working on, I think, was Parkinson's, uh, you know, um, solutions. But also we talked a lot about things they do, not at this site, but at other sites and things they're interested in getting into. And those are the same types of... Um, you know, of, of research that resulted in the, 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 the COVID-19 vaccine that all of us are up and down encouraging everybody to take. And the idea that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have that without this type of, of, of research um, um, right now. Um, and so I think there are opportunities and they've expressed that one of the, one of the problems is right now is um, they're based on the space they have, um, they're booked out something like two years. So if you if there's an important medical thing that the government wants them to work on or the private sector wants them to work on, they can't. They have to wait two years before they can start it. This will allow them to, um, once it's up and running, to expand their capacity right away and begin working on on some of those um, very important um, 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 medical related issues. Um, and so, well, yeah, I mean, and you can see it on their website. There are a number of. Um, of of animals that that are that are on the site and will be on the site, um, 
at the end of the day, what we're looking at here is a medical research facility that is very much important um, to advancing um, the medical field. And, and it's something that, although, you know, you don't always like how everything gets done, it's important to know that sometimes, um, you know, things have to get done if we, if we want to move forward. And um, presently under uh, federal law, it is a requirement to do animal mm -hmm. testing before going on to human testing of different treatments. Uh, so not only is it legally it, permissible, it's actually legally required whether it happens um, yep. here in our city or in our neighboring city, or um, there's even the potential for this company. It's a, it's a very real concern that this company, as part of its expansion and growth, was looking at sites outside of Muskegon and even outside of our state. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an opportunity to retain um, this, this business locally and accommodate its growth. I think, I think if we wouldn't have been able to step up and, and get this deal done in the time we did, there was a pretty strong possibility that they were moving to a, a facility in New York that was already available to them. Um, so, yeah, this is really, it's a piece of economic development. It's important. It's not the same as making widgets or, you know, or the other Frank, parts of it. Excuse but, me. But, excuse me. In the farmer's market, I have a restaurant. So don't act no, like excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, I am going to allow public comment, which is unusual on this topic, but please do not address members of the dais um, from the audience. Thank you. Yeah, I, would hate to. Th I would hate to get involved in the money portion. Thank you. Excuse me, ma'am. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it is, it, it just, it is a piece of, of, of economic development, and there are opportunities, you know, as, as the life science industry grows here, that there could be other components of it that are very high tech that it maybe do not also include um, um, animal testing and could be very beneficial to our community as we move away, in some ways, away from the old manufacturing stigma and the idea of having, helping people that get educated to stay here and have good paying jobs and, and remain um, part of the community. It's a, it really is an important piece. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Commissioners, do you have any other questions or input right now? I am gonna open this up. Uh, to public comment, that is not typical. Uh, however, I realize that this is a, a matter of importance and sensitivity to our community. Um, I ask that members that who that do wish to speak and address the commission to uh, maintain civility and no name calling, and please direct your commentary to me as chair of this commission. So, yes, ma'am, please give your name and address. Diane Neath, 1698 Sanford Street. Two summers ago, I had to have someone contact Mr. Peterson to take roof pieces down at the farmer's market because he did not make sure that the company did not entomb pigeons and their nests. I also worked with Ann Mesh to get these animals out. Do you have comments on this topic? Yes, I do. You're welcome to I do share not. That yes, I do. Under public I do. At the end, but do you have comments on this item? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. I think that all of you need to go through the site. I don't think that Mr. Peterson, who does not care about animals, should be the one to make that decision. If you're making money from this from this business, it's a sad comment that the animals don't matter. Some of you have to own animals. One animal is not less than another. I don't care if it's a monkey. I don't care if it's a rat. One animal is not less than another. And I really hope you think about this. And don't let your, your want of money and jobs win out over what the humane thing is to do. Thank you, Ms. Neese. Do any other members of the public that wish to give input on this topic? Dr. Paletti. Okay. I love Muskegon, and um, I've always tried to promote the idea that we are more than maybe a lot of other people think we are. And um, I lived in Boulder, and the people there took their property very seriously, and they didn't allow things to happen like they have a zero growth for instance they can't build new properties in the town and people pay extra to not have their uh, flat irons ripped up or whatever but i like the idea of attracting new jobs but why can't we attract jobs that are not ones that you know you, this is sort of a nasty business and yeah you'll make more money 
but there are a lot of sensitive souls, their nervous systems will be affected because isn't there an incinerator involved with this? I believe there is, I've read that. So, I mean, uh, yes, uh, somebody else might take the job, just like in Auschwitz, they might have. Oh, please no. Somebody, yeah, well, no, I'll tell you, I sat down at a table in Germany and people asked me, well, you're American, what, what happened here? Well, and they, they, they asked, they, they said, you're wondering, and I go, well, yeah, I did. And so a lot of us didn't believe what was going on. And yeah, it is an animal, but you know, Gandhi said how you treat animals sort of reflects the consciousness. And why not? Why not? We can't we do better in Muskegon? You know, instead of people saying, "Oh, Muskegon's not that bad," can't we make it someplace that we're, you know, we don't have to drag the bottom for jobs? You know, that's thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paletti. And yeah, I did come across that quote um, in my research on this matter in terms of the efficacy of using animal testing uh, for these purposes. And it was actually in a uh, National Institutes of Health um, study that had been presented. And the top of that study said, the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. Um, and so we do have a number of regulatory uh, protocols in place by the federal government that governs the treatment and welfare of these animals as part of the mandated testing. Um, Mr. Hootie, welcome back. Um, in case you're all wondering why I'm here, because I'm from Norton Shore as well. I worked in Muskegon for 20 years. I paid property taxes in Muskegon for 20 years. I'm a native. I was born here. I was born in Hackley Hospital. So um, it's not something I want to do. This isn't my first priority to be here. If things weren't really important, I wouldn't be here. Anyway. Lots of things that are on the on the agenda concern me. My first, I think the first priority ought to be emergency vehicles and the emergency department. If you need police officers, that ought to be really high on the list. Pay them well, hire full-time police officers. Um, equip your fire department with the equipment it needs. They shouldn't be asking for $35,000 to... pertaining to... I'm sorry. Is this connected to this topic at hand? Oh, with I'm sorry. To the I'm sorry. We're not in general public oh, comment I'm yet. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, let me skip to that then. Um, okay. I looked at that, and to me, I don't know anything about it um, other than what I've read, and I don't understand how a contract can be approved by you that has omitted parts. If it's an up and up place, why aren't those admitted parts? Um, let us all read the entire contract without the omitted parts. Um, and also, if there's such a great place, tell us the exact number and the type of animals that are there and what exactly is going to be done to them. Um, if it's cellular research, that's one thing, but um, dissecting any kind of animals like the hundred monkeys that were crossing the country to Pennsylvania I mean it's a stuff we don't know about that's absolutely insanely cruel and to have a place employ and I don't care how many it is but to see cruelty day after day after day if that's what they're doing it's not going to help the um, the climate of who works there it's just like people working in ERs, they're gonna get worn out for seeing such awful things. I, mean, I looked it up on the internet and it just, I could hardly look at it. It just makes me shake to think about it. It's not the kind of reputation we need for Muskegon. You're trying to protect the reputation of Muskegon every time you turn around. I would never denigrate Muskegon. I don't, I love Muskegon, I love everything in it. And this whole world belongs to all of us. Everything is connected. If you are cruel to anything, including any living thing, any living organism, it's going to come back to you. That's why we have climate change right now. Because everybody thought, what does it matter? It's the forest. It's the Amazon. It's the animals. It's the air. It's the water. It's the land. What difference does it make? It's there for us to use. Uh, I'm sorry, folks, but that's not the way it works. Thank you, Mr. Hootie. And I'll have our legal counsel explain um, as to why there are sections in this agreement. It's, it's fairly standard um, to see sections in uh, legal contracts where you have um, language that says intentionally omitted. And so he'll explain that. The intentionally omitted and it 
refer to it that way is as these documents are revised uh, between our office as legal counsel of the city and the lawyers for the buyer, instead of renumbering everything every time and making sure you're then internally consistent on changing the section numbers, you simply have taken out all of the language in that section and you leave it marked as intentionally omitted. So it's not that there's language hidden from anybody, it's been deleted. Thank you, Mr. Cop. All right. Mr. Shaw, Mr. John. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other members of the public wish to give remarks on this? I just have just a quick question. Yes. So Ms. Hilton. Um, I've obviously never been to one of these facilities. Mr. Peterson said he did tour the facility. Can you please give your um, name and address? Uh, Stacy Hilton, 1698 Sanford Street. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So you said that you toured the facility. I am curious what does happen to these animals? at the end of the research? Um, <clears throat> at, at the end of the research? It's well, you said what, what, uh, what kind of eventually happens with these animals. You <clears throat> said you toured the facility, so they must show you what these animals go through, what the end game is for these animals. Yeah, I think, I think the short answer is ev every animal that's through there um, is euthanized um, by the end. So as part of the process, um, you know, as part of the process, they, you have to study um, at the end. And so there would be um, a euthanization and then a study of the, of the uh, impact on the, on the animal. Right. And what type of animal did you see there? Um, I think, I think uh, uh, Mayor Johnson had, has a list on their website of what they, of what they would do work on. I think primates, it would, dogs, yeah, non-human primates. Yeah, I think it would change depending on what, what they're under contract to, to research or what particular um, um, medical device or, or uh, medical procedure that they're doing, that they are um, um, researching. So I think it could, it could change, change by the day or by the, or by the month at least. I mean, I know it happens and I understand it, but it is just kind of sad to say, yeah, well, yeah, they're going to be euthanizing animals and they're going to be testing on them. And, I read that they give them pain medicine so they don't suffer so much while they're testing on them. It's all pretty horrific. <laughs> like I said, I understand it happens, but it's just kind of sad to say, yeah, it's horrific. They're going to be euthanizing all these animals, but we're going to get a kickback from it, and there's going to be some job. That's about all I wanted to say about that. Thank you, Ms. Hilton. I agree. It's... it's, it's um it's a challenging conundrum when we talk about these. There, there are elements of, of life in general that aren't enjoyable or pleasant, um, but that are um, routine or um, part of living in this world. Um, I don't like the thought of it. You know, it can be displeasing, but I recognize the necessity of it, not only because it's mandated, uh, but also because the outcomes of it. Um, there are a number of people that I've heard talk about this as a very bad, negative, disgusting thing, whereas I see the positive out of it. I see the potential for the creation of treatments, life-saving treatments, life-improving, life-affirming treatments, um, whether it's Alzheimer's or Crohn's disease or uh, Parkinson's or Huntington's. Huntington's that has been affected my family. I've lost many members of my family, too. Um, and so the prospect of this, this research leading to those life-saving treatments um, is and helps motivate me to allow. That's enough. So I, I yes, there's a there's an unsettling aspect to it. But I try to look at the the positive and the uplifting and the life affirming aspects of it as well, and. Um, that those animals be treated with care and dignity while um, they're being in service to, to the greater humanity. And, you know, I, for one, would be proud if Muskegon were to be home to a company that contributed to uh, cures for uh, very debilitating uh, diseases. And so the, the financial part helps as well. I, I'll, be, I'll be honest. Um, I have an obligation to do what I think is in the best interest of the city and its citizens. And not only can treatment 
and the research that happens at this facility help improve people's lives um, from a medical and health perspective, but I do see the investments by this company in terms of job creation, um, in terms of supporting our tax base um, to the tunes of hundreds of thousands of dollars a year that can be used to improve the quality of life of our residents across the city and um, supporting programming and supports for our current residents. So I see this having multiple facets of benefits. That's my personal perspective. I'm not speaking for my fellow commissioners. I'm not speaking for any other member um, of City Hall. That's my personal perspective. And so while I can appreciate the sensitivity and unsettling of it, I also have to look at it in, in its complete spectrum. Um, now I will say this, I do support, and I would uh, happily support if, if commissioners wanted to proceed with um, such a resolution, but I do support um, the U.S. Congress adoption of the FDA Modernization Act, uh, which does, and the buyer may not be happy to hear this part, um, but does um, eliminate the requirement of such testing. It does not ban it because they recognize the, the, the value of such testing, and so it would make it optional and um, encourage um, end users to use alternative methods uh, where feasible and where effective. And so I would support that, but I also support um, this sale agreement and this investment um, from um, NBR. So, commissioners, do you have any other comments or questions at this time? I have a question. Yes, does this does if this if this happens does this prohibit any other kind of industry coming to the other parcels of land near? No, okay. no, I doubt it. The the where they're located now, yeah. you wouldn't really notice they were there unless you you know unless you looked for them. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Emery. Yeah, I just thank you for sharing what you shared, Mayor. Um, you know, everybody who knows me knows I have a great love for animals. But, you know, I have an even greater love for the health and the well-being and the livelihood of the human, my human neighbors and citizens and my loved ones. And that's the greater benefit there. Um, that outweighs even my love for animals. So, you know, uh, all of us who have had animals and, you know, and I know my cat wouldn't give up their life for me, but my dog would have in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, I, I am excited about this development in our city. Thanks, Commissioner Emery. Commissioner St. Clair, Commissioner Hood, any questions or input? I will echo um, Commissioner Emery and Mayor Johnson. And this is not an easy decision, and it is not simple. And I think that most of us are animal lovers up here. Um, but I know I personally have benefited from the miracles of medicine many times in my life. And... I think that we have an opportunity to make a hard decision and create an opportunity to continue to move things forward. Do I wish that something less controversial could go in there? Maybe, but we don't always get to choose um, what comes, and I think that it is part of the obligation of being elected officials to make hard decisions that kind of make your stomach hurt sometimes because it's beneficial to the greater good. So. Well said, Commissioner St. Clair. There are no other comments or questions from the dais, and we'll move forward with roll call. Vice Mayor German? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? Yes. 
Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have item D, Wash Muskegon Marketing, and that's being reported out on by our own city clerk. Yes. Do we have a motion, though, before she leads out? I move to authorize the city clerk to enter into an agreement with Kindred Marketing for an amount not to exceed $60,000. Support. All right, we have a motion for Commissioner Gorman and support by Commissioner Emery to authorize the city clerk to enter into an agreement with Kindred for an amount not to exceed $60,000. All right, Madam Clerk, Thank what do you, you got for us? So I think by now everybody's heard of the Wash Muskegon brand, all right? It's up there and all that. It's been around for a little while now. Um, and it's done amazingly well and uh, we've won awards and all kinds of wonderful things and we're very proud of it. Um, and we feel that it's time to kind of move it on um, and, you know, do another kickoff, maybe more like a social media kind of kickoff and and because um, we want to keep that branding alive. We think it's been very beneficial. One thing that is a little bit different is that we are uh, the brand itself is moving more away from the chamber and more towards the city of Muskegon as taking over it. But we're still going to be working with the chamber for sure. And we have a wonderful committee that we've been working on uh, with this together. And we thought we needed new eyes on it to maybe give us some ideas of, of what we can do for this next phase. Um, again, primarily focusing on social media, all the studies we've done with it have shown that's really where we got the biggest bang for our buck um, without putting you know hundreds of thousands of dollars into it. So we went out and we um, requested RFQs from um, companies that could actually do that for us and, and come up with a marketing plan for us. And uh, in our the budget for Watch Muskegon, there is still um, there's some money in there. So we're gonna the chamber's gonna give us twenty thousand dollars of that, and we're requesting to put twenty thousand dollars of our public relations money into it. And if it goes above that, it will be we will ask for private donations from other um, individuals or companies or something like that for anything more. But we think that this would be a really great start. And uh, and out of all of them, all of the candidates were definitely really great and very qualified. Um, but the committee just felt that, that Kindred um, would just do a great job for us. We were just really uh, happy with the proposal that they gave. And we think having a fresh set of eyes on it would, um, would be really beneficial. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Commissioners, questions, input? Yes, Commissioner Gorman. Um, I just want to ask so we can clarify. Um, as someone who worked at the chamber when this campaign launched, it was definitely intended to be countywide. So I guess I'm just interested in the conversations of knowing that it started with that inception and bringing it city focus now. And I am really glad that you said that. So it is still going to be countywide. Okay. It definitely is. Um, we're still going to be working with the whole county. Just that, you know, other, uh, some other communities have come up with their own branding in the meantime. The city of North Shores has a great one out there. White Lake has a great one out there. So as we work um, with the other communities, uh, some communities have been wanting to be involved and other communities not so much. But the city of Muskegon um, has been all in since day one on it and really been a big focus on it. So um, by just kind of taking it in-house more, but... Uh, we've already, you know, made that determination that we will definitely be including all any any other communities who want to be part of it. We're still going to be posting about them on our social media. When we see something happen in Muskegon County that's positive, we're going to put it out there. We don't care where it's at. Um, we're just excited about that. Okay. And then the other thing, I would just, one, I want to say thanks to everybody that did respond to this quote um, because I think every firm listed was at that table when this was just an idea of how to do it. So they've all in their own way already contributed so much to the campaign. Um, I just want to challenge our staff to challenge the firm. Um, I've heard from many people outside of our community, within the city as well, that have just not identified with the brand, have not connected with it. And so I just want to make sure we're really mindful about making sure those opinions are not forgotten mm -hmm. and it, place in consideration as we move this forward um, because it's really important to them. Absolutely. Yeah, great insights on that. Commissioner Gorman, thank you. Uh, commissioners, any other questions or input? No? All right. 
And we will move forward to the roll call. Vice Mayor German? Yes. Commissioner Gorman? Yes. Commissioner Emery? Yes. Commissioner St. Clair? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Hood? Yes. Lincoln passes. All right. All right, commissioners, do you have any other business before we move on to public comment on non-agenda items from the audience? Any other business? All right. So I do have um, a little bit of any other business. Hopefully this will go quickly. Um, you know, we've heard from Mr. Weatherby and others with regard to the, the pathway. I have talked to Director Evans about the prospect of uh, just at least for helping us to make a fully informed decision before we pull the trigger on anything going forward about the prospect of um, bidding out and getting uh, figures for a 12 or 14 foot pathway. Just so we have some additional information um, for us to digest um, going forward. So um, I want to bring that to the commission. If, the, if it's the commission's pleasure for him and he can speak to that process, I touched base with him and said it wasn't going to be too uh, problematic to do so. Um, and he said now is the right timing to ask this because he's meeting with the engineer tomorrow, um, DPZ, so, or DLZ. DLZ. DPZ is the other one that helped us with the SAPI property. DLZ. Um, all right. So if you could just speak to what that prospect is and, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, so we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with DLZ basically to go through that modified motion from earlier this month that um, requested us to revise their proposal and their design scope down to what was decided here. Uh, so we have a meeting with them just to talk through that. If there's a desire for any more changes, that could certainly take shape tomorrow. But I would, I guess I would look to this board if there's a desire for more changes or options that weren't captured in that previous motion. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Do you have something, Commissioner Emery? Yes, I would like it looked at to make it 10 to 12 feet instead of 16 feet. If we can do that. As an alternative? Yes, um, yes. Options. Just additional information. Um, Commissioner German? Uh, uh, yes. Vice Mayor German? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got to get used to it myself. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I know when I talked to you, Mr. Evans, from the um, seat here, um, I asked for your expertise, you know, moving forward, you know, with this project. Um, do you feel comfortable with 16 feet? I'm not an expert in this area, so I rely on um, the expertise of, you know, the director, staff, but also input from the uh, community also. Um, maybe Mr. Weatherby, did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? I've talked with you before. Um, um, and you've given um, excellent insight. Um, you know, due to some of the, you know, I, I like the fact when you said uh, a study, um, a possibility of a study, I should say. Um, I think looking at it in that form, you would actually probably get some facts or to the findings of which, what works, what don't. Um, Again, uh, this is not my field of expertise. Um, you're in this area, but that would uh, be something that I would probably uh, want to see considered, um, if possible, and see if there's a need for a 16 feet wide um, pathway. Okay. Um, I don't, yeah, I, we can talk to them about that. I guess I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head. There, you know, there are a lot of standards you can pull from for something like this. There are certainly standards that say 10 to 12 feet is the right width. There are certainly standards that say 15 to 16 feet is the right width. Um, you know, a study is as good as it is, I guess. If it's something that this commission would like us to have DLZ create and prepare for this project, we can do that. Uh, it would just come at additional cost to the project. Um, if you're looking for something more along the lines of what Mayor Johnson suggested in having them prepare a bid alternate for a 12 foot path or whatever that width may be, um, that can also easily be done. Uh, that's a pretty simple, that's a much simpler undertaking than uh, entire study and starting over, I guess. Uh, my recommendation, you know, I would stand with my 16 foot or the 20 foot even that we discussed prior, but um, certainly say that's not the only opinion out there either, so. 
And there was some concerns also with safety, and I think that's one of the most important things. Uh, you know, when citizens and residents are out at the beach, you know, you, you want to have a good time, you want to enjoy, you know, the festivities, uh, but you definitely want to be safe. And um, so I would just uh, add to that, uh, you know, have those uh, precautions and, and make sure that the study's done right or we look at all aspects of, you know, moving forward with this and considering everyone, you know. Thank you, Vice Mayor German. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, my bringing this up wasn't um, for us to uh, rehash or re-deliberate this, because uh, we did vote on it and decided to move forward with engineering. Um, that's not the end-all, be-all. This is going to come back to us uh, for us to decide to how to fund it, and pull the trigger on actually constructing it and what that timeline looks like. My interest in um, asking for alternative bid, um, was I thought it was a good idea, I heard, and I was like, yeah, it'd be nice to have additional information to inform our decision making. Um, so that's why I brought it to Director Evans and um, he indicated it wouldn't be too uh, painful to, to include. Um, and now would be the time to ask this, if we want this information. So um, do we want this information? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Do you have enough information to, to go on um, in terms of alternative bed? Certainly. What was the number you're looking for, I guess, one more time? Um, 12 or 14? Or can we, how difficult would it be to look at 12, 14, and 16? I don't think that difficult. Okay. I'm gonna, I can ask that question. All right. We're good then. Thank you, Director Evans. Good. Appreciate you. All right, any other business before we go to public comment? All right, well, we have uh, a special guest, Senator Bumstead, here. Um, and so I will give the, the podium and the floor to him to speak. Welcome, Senator Bumstead. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And, and commissioners, glad to be here. You don't mind if I slip this off for a second? Uh, if you give me about six minutes, I, we're working on some packages in Lansing. But before I get into those, I want to take a few minutes uh, the whole prison property was a lot of work of Senator Hansen, my pr the previous senator, so I want to thank him for all of his hard work. His chief of staff at the time, Peter Wills, how many hundreds of hours you spent on the prison property? Probably hundreds of hours. Because of their hard work, it's where we're at today, so thank you. Yes. So. Cheers. Also, also earlier, you mentioned like down at the, when he hit the oil, hit the gas well down at the uh, arena. I got a call that day from Frank, then I got a call from the owner, uh, Rooks, John Rooks. And we went right to the DEQ that day. And within a week, I think it was eight, eight days, we got a special grant for DEQ. Typically those grants will take up to eight months to get some of those. So because of the hard work and quick action of the builder, the owner in the city, uh, that never happens. In Lansing believe me it just <laughs> never happens that quick and it was good response you had the right answers and it was a problem we had to fix otherwise that project was going to be dead in the water until the funding so that, that was two good projects that you know, took quick action and it worked but I'd like to talk a little bit I think everybody got a copy there's a copy of uh, the Senate Bill 565 and I want to discuss that one a little bit long in more detail than the other two because it is a little bit longer but it's basically, it's my bill, it passed the Senate 33 to 0 about three and a half, almost a month, weeks ago or a month ago. It's over in the House now and hopefully they'll take it up in the next couple of weeks. The governor will sign it anytime you get a bipartisan bill with, you know, with that kind of support. And we've worked with a lot of the locals, we've worked with uh, city manager, we've, we've, we've worked with uh, Peter, we worked with Jake. Uh, there's a lot of projects going on in Muskegon, as you all know, and some of these dollars are focused on Muskegon projects. And we've been working hand in hand with everybody. It's been a lot of hard work, but I just want to let you know a lot of that money is heading this direction. The west side is getting notice in this package. So just kind of go through it. It's a $3.34 .3 billion package. And if anybody wants a copy of this, we can make sure you can get these. And, but, and the governor will sign it. It's a billion dollars of federal dollars. Or it's the ARPA dollars, we want to make sure, you know, we have people, let's send that money back, we don't want to use it. Well, to me, if we can use it for projects that make a difference in people's lives, hard dollars. 
road dollars, infrastructure dollars, why don't we spend it for those things? So that's, I, I'll support those projects 100% of the time. And this, these dollars, it's, it's really going to benefit West Michigan. It's not just Southeast Michigan, but West Michigan and the rural areas. It's a billion dollars for uh, lead line replacements. That's huge. Not just Detroit and Pontiac and Flint, but it's big in Muskegon, it's big in Nuevo, it's big in all of our communities. There's lead lines everywhere. So we want to make sure we get our fair share of that. Uh, dam safety programs, the east side of the state last year we lost two dams. Did hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. We want to make sure we ne that never happens again. So we want to go and make sure we can maintain those dams or have the money, if they're in bad shape, to remove those dams. Uh, drinking water, wastewater facilities, I think the county can benefit from this and their smaller local locals. Uh, there's going to be a ton of money in there. I'm, and I'm just doing a broad overview, I'm not going to get into each each uh, realm of where the dollars are at, but at least you have a copy of where these dollars are. Then uh, on page two, two, $290 million remaining authorization of the Great Lakes Water Quality Bond. Uh, that, that bill is part of Senator Altman's and Wono's, Wojo's, uh, would allow community success funds through grants for wastewater, stormwater, and non-point uh, source projects. I think Muskegon can take advantage of those dollars. PFAS, uh, that one is a big one for Muskegon. It's $100 million. If you look towards the bottom, there's $15 million allocated through the boilerplate to address PFAS uh, at the orphan site connected to Lake Michigan. That's all based, population based, so it's for Muskegon only. That's for the SAPI property. Uh, Great Lakes Water Authority, $400 million. A Great Lakes Water Authority supplies nearly 40% of Michigan's population of drinking water and provides nearly 30% of wastewater services in the state. Funding will address the wastewater and drinking water infrastructure improvements. We can all take advantage of that. Uh, Great Lakes uh, Surface Water Action, $25 million. We don't know in the state what our water does below grade. We've never actually done a map, complete map of the whole state. So we want to make sure you would think Ottawa County has a lot of water. There's places in Ottawa County you can't get put a well down. There's no water there. So we're going to be able, instead of, you know, if you allocate, you want to do a development, and all of a sudden they can't get water to it, that's a problem. So we need to track and map our water throughout the state of Michigan. That's really vital. Um, there's a home repair program. That was for some uh, projects in Detroit. But if once this gets passed in the House, hopefully they'll take it up, and like I say, in the next month the governor will sign it. Then we'll figure out how Muskegon, Muskegon County, and residents of, of the district can access those dollars. It's going to be very critical. And uh, we have meetings regularly with, with the city manager and uh, Jake and Peter, and we just want to work together to make sure we can bring home as many dollars as possible. So it's all these pro projects in uh, Muskegon. We just, uh, it's like the one project. We're working on Harbor 31. The state kind of came through and said, well, you need to mitigate that, that problem. It's going to take $2 million to wetlands mitigation. We put $10 million in this to help pay for that. So that, that's the type of dollars that stops a project dead in its tracks from the DEQ. So we get along very well with the DEQ director. Um, I know Peter Wills worked with her for years. I've worked with her for years. She's a good gal. It's just kind of the bureaucracy down the line. <coughs> and uh, so it's just a matter of sometimes getting in front of her, explaining what we need here, our needs in Muskegon. And normally we can work it out. Sometimes it takes a while. It might take a year. It might take two years. But at the end of the day, we, we need to do what's best for our residents. Then the second package you're going to like, uh, the veterans, you know, they get their 100% disabled tax break. I want to make sure the locals are held harmless. So we're working with the veterans group. We're working with MTA and, and the city groups and um, to fund that every year to make sure everybody gets their money back. Because it was some language that was passed six or eight years ago to give the veterans, 100% disabled veterans, their property taxes. I get it. Thank you for your service. But we, did, we kind of put the screws to the locals. I mean, some, I have some townships that sixty, eighty thousand dollars is cost them. Let's make those whole. Let's make you whole. And I don't know what it is to the city of Muskegon, but it's probably substantial. That's that's a bill we're working on right now. In fact, we had the veterans in today. We were talking about that one. 
and uh, hopefully we'll take it up shortly. <clears throat> now the one I like is you, a lot of you know me. I, I chair the DNR budget and the Eagle budget, but our state parks, our wildlands are very important to me, and it should be important to everybody in Muskegon. So what? It's a three bill package. <laughs> My bill is Senate Bill 702. It's $508 million that goes to the State Park Endowment Fund to allow the fund to reach its full cap. So a lot of you don't know how that's set up. Once that reaches or $800 million, the interest from that can be used to maintain our state parks. We've been short on maintenance for many, many years. Senator McBroom's bill <clears throat> excuse me 703 we're short in the state parks of about 250 million dollars in infrastructure uh, backlog his bill goes through the, all, every state park in the state of Michigan fixes that backlog now with that backlog fixed we can use that state park endowment fund to maintain our parks forever we never have to go back we never have general fund again because normally it would take us up to 30 years to get that 800 million if we do it right now while well, we have this $250 million to fix our state parks, now we can maintain them forever. It's a win-win for everybody. Good way to spend these federal dollars. <clears throat> then uh, Senator McDonald's bill, uh, this is going to be good for the locals as well. He has $150 million for a new grant program for local park systems modeled after existing recreational passport grant program. There's no reason your folks at the city cannot take advantage of that. And maintain you're talking about parks earlier this is the this is a pot of money we can use to do that so the the complete breakdown of the bills is at the bottom and I'll let you, you can take this take them home with you and read those but it's really a good bill packages using the federal dollars wisely it's going to benefit us greatly in Muskegon and West Michigan tourism clean water clean water for our kids it's and uh, the governor will sign it if it gets in front of her so, any questions on these packages but we've been working hard we just want to make sure we get our, our fair share. If we have our meetings with Frank and Jake and Peter, and we just got to make sure all these projects get moving along. And there's dollars in here to help with that. Excellent. Thanks so much for your hard work, um, uh, standalone and in collaboration with our staff on bringing as many of these dollars to, to our community and investing in worthwhile projects. So thank you for that, and appreciate you being here tonight and updating us. Yep. Uh, and you if you don't, if you don't have folks that know how to. You know, there's these pots of money all throughout in different programs. You, you need to really figure out where they're at. And uh, it's, it's not easy sometimes. And it just depends what expertise you have in your office. Yeah. Peter Director Wills, Wills is Senator, Hans, Senator Hans is right-hand man for years. And it takes a while to learn where those pockets of money are. It's, it, it just takes a long time. <laughs> you have a lot of legislators in Lansing. They're there and they hire their friends to go. To, they have no idea what's going on. So it's critical that you have that type of experience that can work with us and, and the city manager. It's great. So it's, it's, uh, it doesn't happen everywhere. We've been very fortunate to have to Director Wills uh, bring his experience uh, <laughs> to bear for the benefit of our community. Yeah, but, yeah Senator sure. Hanson, that whole prison property, that was one of his primary projects, and it was not a lot of time to do that. So it's, yeah. it's good stuff. It is. I mean, it really is. When, when that prison shuttered, not only was a loss of jobs, <laughs> Um, in, our, in our community, but now is what are we going to do with the old prison site? Yeah. Um, there was money clean ups. Everyone came together, collaborated, identified resources, uh, worked together, uh, obtained that property. We might have a tax demoed base. Demoed and, and, yeah, create create new development and a tax base. So Thank it you. is good stuff. Thank you. Did, the commissioners, do you have any questions for uh, Senator Bumstead? I just want to say thank you, Senator Bumstead, for making the time for us today. And personally, I'm just so excited to see the lead line replacement on that bill. Um, coming out of the commission during our orientation, I asked Director Evans kind of what keeps him up at night, what he thinks about the city, and that that's a huge issue. So whatever money we can get back to the city, I'm very, very excited about. Let us know if we can be any help in that effort um, to take care of our residents. That is a pressing matter that just every day, it's just one day more. So. When I, before I leave, I'll make sure everybody has my cell phone, please. Anybody in the problem, I give it to everybody. Thank you. Get a hold of me, please. <laughs> Thank you, Senator, well, Senator Bumstead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Director Evans certainly is consistent on that. Because I asked him oh, yeah. that too. Like, what is the top challenge for you? And he said, that's what keeps him up at night. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, thank you all. Um, any else, anybody else from the public wish to give remark or input? Uh, Mr. Weatherby, you would like to return? 
Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Tom Weatherby, 1747 Edgewater. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I should have timed my letter before I came down here. I didn't realize it was that long. Um, happens to all of us, even the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> I will be sending a copy of the letter to all of you, but for the sake of the audience and those at home, I'd like to finish the last item that I had on there. Even though you kind of touched on it and resolved it to a certain extent before I got up here, but I put a lot of time into it, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> um, third item was cost. One area that has not been discussed is the added cost for this excessively wide walkway. I did an online cost calculator for this 3,700 foot long walkway and came up with a savings of, uh, and this is 10 foot versus 16 foot. I com came up with a savings of $193,880 by reducing this from 16 feet to 10 feet. Wanting to verify this number, I contacted a local contractor and came up with a savings of 81400 probably more in the neighborhood of what it probably is. Either way, there is a considerable savings. As a commission, you need to look, you need to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollars, and I feel that the money saved would be better served in other areas to increase accessibility to the beach, such as a barrier-free bathroom at the south end of the beach, extra barrier-free picnic tables, or a paved patio area at the end of the barrier-free walkway in lieu of the old wood patio area that has nails and boards that stick out of it. That's, that's the area at the end of, by the bathhouse down here. I don't see anything in the pr new proposal to replace what's down there. Um, you could, you could have a 12-foot wide walkway that is des designed in excess of any of the design guidelines, guidelines that I've given you and still provide increased accessibility to the be beach in other areas. This would be a win-win situation in, in my view. Um, and I was going to propose that you get two bids, one for a, a 10 and one 16. And while you're doing that, you, the, su the summer gives you time to do a study on how, how many people are actually using the walkway down there. I plan, I don't, uh, Commissioner German mentioned it, but I don't think you have to hire anybody. I'm going to be sitting down there and I'll share my information with you. I'm going to count people and <laughs> uh, bikes, walkers, joggers, people walking their dog. They'll all be different categories. And I'm going to tell you how many people walk on that sidewalk in an hour's time. And I guarantee it's not anywhere near 300. Um, so if anyone wants to call me, you know, you have my number. I'm, I'm willing to discuss any options with anybody. I have some other ideas, but I'm not, we're not going to go into them tonight. Um, thank you for your time. and we'll, be well, thank you, Mr. Weatherby. You're certainly a wealth of information, and I, I value your input. Um, and I would be interested in better understanding that, that uh, metric, um, because the document that I read was 300 users per hour at peak time. So I'd be interested in understanding what peak time means, particularly when you have a seasonal um, amenity you know, at Pure Marquette. I'll so. do a study on a cloudy day. I'll do a study <laughs> on a sunny day. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Mr. Weatherby. Right. Um, anyone else in the audience wish to give public remarks? I do. Yes, Mr. Olson. You have three minutes. Please give your name and address. Sure. Uh, Derek Olson, 2016 Estes Street. So I got to do the mask off thing while I talk. So breathe in my, breathe in my mask. Thank you. So, uh, I wanted to say thank you to everybody on the commission who worked recently. Uh, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, I know, was involved, and, and everybody had things to say about the removal of the offensive public art that was on the arena. And I think that it was just a wonderful uh, gesture to to the people who were. Uh, you know, upset by that, that, that the commission reacted and that the city responded uh, by taking it down. Uh, so thank you to everybody and cheers, cheers to you all for taking part in that. Um, I'm here because of the beach. I'm happy that we're back talking about the width of the trail because I felt like in the beginning there weren't very many options. I felt like it was like we need to do this and here's what we're going to do. And I wish there had been two or three plans that we all could have seen that included saving the trees, included a 10 foot wide bike path and, and, and redoing some parking and not just uh, the, the seemingly single pointed focus of a gigantic 
walkway. Um, I was down there in the section of beach uh, thinking about it between the deck restaurant and the channel and you couldn't even come close to putting a I don't think a 16 foot wide bike path there without really coming into the beach and negatively affecting the beach. So I know that's our plan to continue whatever path we do all the way down which I think is great um, but there are sections of the beach where even a 16 foot wide path is too wide and I believe that, 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 that Tom is right on the money that we need to investigate what we really need with some sort of science other than arbitrarily stretching a tape measure out on the floor inside of the city commission and saying 16 feet sounds better than 20 feet. I really think there ought to be some sort of study uh, that happens. Um, and, and I <laughs> I wish that Eagle, it's interesting that Senator Bumstead was here talking tonight and he's in charge of Eagle funding or on that commission or whatever, um, because I can't believe that it's okay for us to pave into the beach in what I believe ought to be a critical dune area, uh, that, it's, that it's okay for us to pave into the beach that far. Um, it's, it's what seems to me like a really bad plan. Uh, and excessive on a bunch of levels. I agree that we need better accessibility at Pier Marquette Park. I love the idea of a nice wide path coming off of the bike path so that people can wheelchair down there or whatever we want to do and share that section of the beach. But I don't think we need to pave the whole thing. It's it's horrific and scary to me as I walk it uh, that, that we're going to spend that much money uh, and, and, <laughs> and resources cementing the beach paving uh, Paradise to put in a parking lot, as the as the lyrics of the song go. And so, um, like I said, thanks again, and I'm glad that we're reinvestigating a smaller width path because I just don't think that there's any need for the large one. And uh, again, I appreciate you guys' time, and thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Um, so, wanted to touch on with regard to the critical dune. Um, I did speak with Deagle, I spoke with Deagle last year about uh, what had been approved last year, which I opposed the, the project last year, and I spoke with uh, Deagle before our consideration at our work session at the last meeting to speak to her versus the options that were presented, because we had option one and option two presented. Option one reflected last year, option two, what was adopted last year, option two um, deviated from that. And actually option two aligned with um, that alternative plan, which I sometimes called the Weatherby plan, he doesn't like it being called the weather be plan. Um, but that, that option does not have parking encroachment onto the beach, does not uh, remove the trees or vegetation. And so um, in speaking with Deagle, my understanding from her that the option we went with does not necessitate um, a state review or permitting. Um, option one would have in their, in their um, uh, assessment, and, and in my understanding as well, an agreement. However, despite it not being required, technically, I have asked our, um, our team, um, Mr. Frank, not Mr. Frank, Frank, Mr. Peterson, and uh, Director Evans, uh, to do that nonetheless. And so we're gonna treat this as a special use project, and we're going to apply through the state, Deagle, um, even though it's not required. Uh, so just to make sure there's any questions or concerns or qualms about that are uh, resolved. And so we are gonna do that process. Um, and I would like to say one more thing on that because I've heard some grief and concerns, rumblings from folks after we made the decision, and we had considerable deliberation on it, um, that the city was not being respectful, that we weren't listening to folks, that um, we were ignoring people, that we're, that we're not doing what the majority of folks wanted. And I will say, as someone who's been part of this process uh, for its duration last year and this year, that what I heard last year from folks with regard to this, and I had, I had invited Director Evans down to uh, the beach to meet with folks um, and answer questions. You were there, Mr. Olson, as others in this room. And um, this is where the idea of that alternative plan came to be and what we ultimately adopted. And the feedback we received then which was the letter circulating that many people sent in, was to um, remove the third row of parking on Beach Street, which we did permanently, which was to save the trees, which we did, which was to change from asphalt to concrete for the pathway, which we did, um, as well as to narrow the pathway from 20 feet, which was staff's initial recommendation, which we did. 
Uh, we didn't narrow it necessarily as uh, to the extent that uh, some folks wanted. Some folks want eight, some want 10, some want 12. You can call that arbitrary or not. Um, I realize that there are minimum design standards at play that vary across uh, state and country. Um, and some of us <coughs> reviewed that, relied on that, and staff did as well in their recommendation. And, and I can understand their reasoning as to why they initially recommended 20 feet. But I just want to say that this commission has been receptive and responsive and respectful to the considerable feedback and input that we've received on this. Um, so that's all I want to say. That's not necessarily directed at you, <laughs> Mr. Olson, but it just uh, prompted me to, to uh, speak on this issue at this time. So. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, Director Evans, not to bring you up on this topic. <laughs> uh, you've heard enough on, on this matter, I'm sure. However, I understand we have a new deputy director uh, for DBW. Do. I didn't tell him that he was going to have to come up here, but I'll make him come up here. Um, we had a retirement at DPW. Doug Sales was our superintendent of public works. He retired after 38 years of full-time service in the end of December. Uh, so in Doug's retirement, uh, we decided to go a little bit different direction. I hired a deputy director of public works to kind of take over a lot of the same duties, but also serve as a backup for me uh, when I can't be places and uh, kind of fill in some gaps there. So with that, I'll introduce Dan Vanderheide. Dan comes to us from Spalding and Decker, was an engineering firm. Prior to that, he worked for the city of Kentwood as the city engineer there for a number of years and also with Williams and Works, right? to that so uh, Dan is another licensed engineer on staff so we now have two licensed engineers on staff and looking forward to having him around All right. we, we actually have three still right because uh, uh, the deputy city manager retains her uh, engineer license I believe she hasn't I think she, she may have let she, hers she lapse I don't know renewal. if she did or not I, I've, I'll defer to her <laughs> she may still have hers it's always nice to have more but um, Dan I didn't catch the last name Vanderhyde. Vanderhyde. Okay, it is Vanderhyde. I didn't know if that was the previous place of employment or if that's actually your last name. <laughs> Mr. Vanderhyde, would you like to come up and uh, introduce yourself and share any remarks you'd like? And welcome to the city of Muskegon. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, thank you, Leo. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to being here. I'm, I'm Dan Vanderhyde, as Leo said. I'll uh, be uh, helping him uh, serve the city. And uh, my wife and I live in uh, Norton Shores. Kids and uh, have been, uh, I've been looking to, uh, to to start to work for for Muskegon and uh, for for many years now actually. Uh, so I'm excited to be here and, and looking forward to uh, getting to work. Thank you, Mr. Vanderhyde. And um, has anyone uh, informed you of our incentive program for uh, staff <laughs> living in the city of Muskegon? I have been. Yes. Thank you. All right. Excellent. We'd welcome you here in the city of Muskegon. And um, you know, as you might be able to tell from tonight, we have a very passionate public that likes to uh, inform us um, and engage us. So look forward to that. We also have uh, many of your, your neighbors in Northern Shores who'd like to engage us as well. Uh, but I, I appreciate the, the feedback. I look at every non-resident as a potential future resident of our magnificent city. So thank you, Mr. Thank Van you. Hyde. All right. Any um, final people from the public? Dr. Paletti, did you already speak during the general public comment? No. All right, then we'll, we'll end with you. I want to thank the senator for coming. I've been to your office, and I, I like the idea we're getting money for parks. Um, uh, one of the things I want to do is, since we've got pots of money, we don't have money for people to put uh, a lot of people out here with blue uh, tarps on their roof. Our houses are being torn down and we're building lesser houses and maybe we can get money for that. The other thing I'd like to see is we don't have a way to get here by any mass transit. My son doesn't drive a vehicle. He needs a bus. We don't have bus system to Muskegon. A lot of the people here didn't know that. I don't know if you know that, Senator, but if you have any weight with the uh, Greyhound or business out of Owasso, that would be very helpful. Or even if you could get a train line here, that would be awesome as well. Because, uh, And then as far as having money towards doing more busing for the people in town where I live, I have a friend that's disabled across the street and we used to have a bus line right in front of my house. 
and that's gone now. And I know we have different alternatives, but they get to be a little expensive for people with $500 a month, Social Security and stuff like that. Uh, and the other thing about the building of the path, I talked to the TART trail guy, it doesn't have to be the same length all throughout. Like where we're doing, we're talking to the Mac over there, the Mac Kite Place. It doesn't have to be 20 feet over there or 16 feet. You know, six, 10 feet would be fine. But then when you get closer to the playground, that's where you need a widening. And I, and like I say, I ride my bike all the time, and uh, there's not a problem down that way. It's a problem where we get the playground and the restaurant. And that's where it's bad. And then I don't know how you're going to get around the. Um, Volleyball uh, people. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Pilati. All right. If there's nothing else, we have a motion to adjourn. No, you all want to continue talking? <laughs> <laughs> motion so to moved. adjourn. Yeah. So all moved. right. We've got a, a motion uh, from Commissioner Gorman, seconded by uh, <laughs> Commissioner Vice Mayor German, mm -hmm. um, to adjourn. All of us. Yep. Ready to go. All in favor? That is. Aye. 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 All right. Let's go and have dinner. Thank you all.